Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start to by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands that we're meeting today. We are talking today about one of my favourite topics, making an impact, and I'm surrounded by some incredible women, but as they are entrepreneurs, <laughs> I would love them to um, pop up here alongside me, <laughs> and I would like to hear their descriptions of them and their business so you can get a little insight into, I guess, their own pictures. <laughs> Come on up, ladies. <laughs> So why don't we kick off today and um, have each of you talk about what you do and if it's okay, start with, I guess, the question of what making an impact means to you. Would you like to kick us off, Yaz? All right. So I'm Yaz. Oh, I'm the loud one. <laughs> um, what do I do? Actually, I'm going to change that. I don't ever ask what you do because the vehicle you're in today might be different to the vehicle you're in tomorrow. So my question is always, who are you? So I'm Yaz, I'm a founder, I'm a mother. I am definitely intense, extreme, and have endurance that will blow your mind. And for 30 years I've been told I will burn out. And every year I burn brighter because I'm strong in the mind. I eat healthy and exercise, and I believe that anything is possible if you can train your mind to believe it. I also am very proud to say that Hashtag, I love myself. And I put that out there up front because we should all fall in love with ourselves. And it doesn't matter what we do in our businesses. What matters most is how we see ourselves every day. And then you will build the best business that you ever could or be an entrepreneur and help someone else build, build the best business you ever could. But what is my business? It's called Seconomy, formerly World's Biggest Garage Sale. We rescue and recover resources, repair e-commerce, or as I like to say, we turn surprise chain into supply chain. And we make money and we make a difference and we make an impact and we do it loudly and proudly. Beautiful, thank you, yes. Rebecca, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rebecca. Uh, I am formerly the CEO of Library for All. Um, I'm also the founder of Library for All. Uh, recently handed over the CEO role, um, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Library for All is a social enterprise. Uh, we were acquired by Save the Children two and a half years ago. Um, so we are now part of the Save the Children family. Uh, but Library for All is an enterprise that was established to fill the gap uh, where literacy and education resources are missing globally. So for many of you, you probably don't realise, but there's about 800 million children that go to school every day and they don't even learn the basics of literacy. Uh, about 8 in 10 10-year-olds 10 globally are leaving school and can't even read a single sentence. Um, so if you think about the 10-year-olds in your life and you think, what would happen if they couldn't read a single sentence? Their life would look very different. So we have spent the last 10 years building education resources and filling that gap. Um, one of the things that are missing is that children just don't have access to basic resources. You might find it hard to believe, but you can't learn to read if you don't have access to books. Uh, and so we provide resources, books, education, software and technology that helps children learn to read and become numerate as well. Um, the problem is so large. Um, we're in 14 countries right now, uh, but there's approximately 95 still to go um, that are lacking those resources. So I've spent the last decade focused on impact, so it's a good day um, to be here. Uh, that's what I kind of live and breathe is the impact of the organisation and really focused on those 800 million children and what their life looks like post-literacy. Amazing. <laughs> Gina. <laughs> yes, hi. Um, so I'm Gina, owner and founder of Sunbubs, um, a sun-safe clothing brand designed for early learning centres in the primary school sector. Um, who am I? I'm a mother, first and foremost, um, to a two and a four-year-old. Um, and really making an impact for me from a personal perspective is being a great mum, being a great wife, um, being a wonderful friend and a community member. Um, and how I do that is through, you know, empathy and kindness and um, I guess having a listening ear. 
and an open heart, yes. <laughs> um, and how are we making an impact at Sunbubs? Well, we're hoping to be part of uh, reducing melanoma in the future. And how we do that is really through two things. Um, one is education. Um, so I'm part of a community of scientists that write melanoma papers in the background or prevention papers in the background. And really the idea is to communicate to the public um, the importance of UPF 50 plus fabric, um, the importance of coverage, and the idea that both those together reduce mole numbers. And mole numbers is really the precursor to melanoma. So Sunbubs is really um, echoes that. Um, so it's a brand, uh, Sunbub shirts are made out of UPF 50 plus fabric tested by our PANSA, which is the governing body for radiation nuclear safety across Australia. They actually have 300 plus protection, wet or dry. Um, and uh, they offer more coverage and they're made um, more sustainably. So out of organic cotton or GOTS certified organic cotton. And Steph. Yes. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Um, Stephanie Parkin. I come from the Kwandamooka people of North Strabroke Island, Moreton Bay area. So we're the traditional owners of the lands and waters of that area. And yeah, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land. I'm a visitor here. This is not my country. My country's um, over there on Kwandamooka country, land and waters. So that's part of protocol that we do. We acknowledge where we are and that we're a visitor here. I'm a visitor here. Um, so uh, I wear a few different hats, but I'm an intellectual property lawyer. And so earlier this year, my business partner and I, Cassie Lang, she's a Bundjalung woman, um, we started Parallax Legal um, in February of this year. So we're very new, law firm and consultancy practice. Cassie and I have known each other for a very long time. We've been on different journeys and the stars align, so to speak. We came back together and joined forces um, to create Parallax Legal earlier this year. And I think the journey for us has been one about um, bringing perspectives together. That's what Parallax means. The name is, um, it comes from, or it's based in astronomy, the Parallax Effect and it means looking at the same thing from two different points of view. So Cassie and I are very passionate about working with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, uh, making sure that their rights are protected, recognised, promoted and respected through all contractual arrangements uh, that we can deal with. Um, but we, equally, we also work with government, corporations and business. They want to know how to do the right thing too. They want to know how to engage with our communities. So we bring those perspectives together at Parallax Legal. Um, so our journey has been really interesting and can talk more about that impact and how we've gotten there, but that's just a, a bit about me to start with. I just want to... Look, you are tackling some of the world's and Australia's biggest challenges right now. And I think, Rebecca, you said, you know, that can get quite overwhelming, right? You're just, you know, digging into it and it can be really overwhelming what you're confronted with and what you've still got ahead of you. So what I'd really like to um, hear you all share is, I guess, where you find that source of strength or resilience or self-care. Um, where do you find, I guess, your guide to keep on going and keep pushing ahead in your respective areas and the challenges you're trying to address? Steph, I'm going to start with yeah, you. Yeah, all right. Um, I think for us, being really clear on the why and always reflecting on the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why does Parallax Legal exist? Um, and I think for Cassie and I, the why is about um, making sure that our community's voices um, are heard and looked after and acknowledged. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of well-intentioned people out there, governments, corporations, businesses, don't always get it right. There's a bit more that needs to be done uh, when dealing with our communities. So I think for Cassie and I, um, the why is about making sure that our clients' rights are respected and looked after. 
And that requires something different. Anyone who goes to law school, does the law training, um, does the practical legal training, anyone can be a lawyer. Anyone can give communities advice or anyone else advice. But it's the knowledge that we have about our communities and how we know how our communities engage with each other, the diversity of our communities. Um, so I think that's the different thing that we bring, the point of difference, is understanding who our market is, market, so to speak, who our communities are, and being able to engage with them in a way that makes sense, and engage in a way that um, results in really good outcomes, not only just for our mob, but for everyone else as well. Um, so the why is really important, and that's what we come back to all of the time. And in terms of resilience, well, I'm not just me now. There's been, I come from a long line of um, you know, very hard-working, honest, and uh, respectable ancestors, people that I've come from. So all the decisions and things that they've made um, have led me to where I am right now and the things that I can do. So it's not just about me, it's about everyone else who's come before me. So that's where I get my strength, looking back. And so when I think about it like that, it's easy. I can keep going. I love that perspective. I love, like, tapping back into, you know, what led to you being here is not just you. That's Absolutely. a beautiful point yeah. of resilience. Thank We're you We're only one that. part of a much larger picture. 100%. Gina. Yeah, I, thank you, Steph, for thank saying you. the why. I think that's so critical. And often when things get tough, just go back to your why. Um, so for Sunbubs, you know, the why is, you know, melanoma numbers. Um, Unfortunately for us, um, it's a critical problem. Um, it costs our government a billion dollars a year in treatments alone. Um, it's the most expensive cancer. It's the third most common cancer for Aussie women, um, the second most common cancer for Aussie men. Uh, what was most shocking for me, it's the most common cancer in 20 to 39-year-olds. So it's not just uh, an older person illness. Um, and the reason behind it is consistent uh, UVR exposure um, p uh, from the younger years. So re the resilience piece is certainly understanding your why, you know, why, why are we here? We're here to make a difference. Um, and how I've built that resilience when I reflect on it is really through being told no a lot of the time um, and dusting yourself off and um, then having that perseverance piece of um, keep on going. And I've heard Yaz speak many times, but one thing that really resonated with me, or many things have, but this particular thing with regards to resilience is going into your hut. Now, you can speak to that, Yaz, but it's your heart and your gut combined and using that to drive some of your decisions and then with that, your experience as well. I really, really love that message and I want to hear more about that, Yaz, because I think yes. particularly as women from a young age, we're told not to trust our own yes. bodies, our own hearts, our own gut. We actually have to suppress that a lot of the time. So. That's going to stick with me too. <laughs> Rebecca? Uh, I think for me, I've had, you know, 10, nearly 11 years of running this organisation and scaling it. And I think I've had lots of this, which I'm sure many of you have experienced. You have the moments where you feel like you're on the floor and, you know, we had our COVID year last year where we um, all, you know, we were staring down the barrel of having to fire six people, which we've never had to do ever. Uh, and we managed our way out of that. And this year we've gone through the roof again. Um, and so I've, and my pattern recognition is that you have really shit moments and you have to make your way through it because the why is so important. Um, but I think what I've learnt over the years is actually what, what fires me up has, is different. So I'm a starter. What I've learned about myself is that I'm a starter. I can get things moving. I can get everybody on the train. I get momentum, I can get funding, all of those things that you need up front, I'm really, really good at. What I'm not great at is actually processes and procedures and building the things that underpin a very big scaling organisation. 
I hate those things. <laughs> and I, it got to the end of last year, one of our toughest years ever, and I'm like, I'm really burnt out. Like, I, I'm literally this close to leaving an organisation that I've built out of sweat and blood and love and the why is so strong. I wake up every morning thinking about it or I'm on calls late at night. You know, we've got a humongous Ukraine project right now. It couldn't be more important, you know, um, reaching four million refugee children that are, that are missing out on education. And so the why is never a problem. Um, it's just whether you kind of can pull yourself up off the mat again and again. And I got to Christmas and I was like, I think I'm done. I don't think I can do this anymore. I'm done. And I really reflected on it. I took a few weeks off and I just kind of reflected on it. And I realised that I was doing mostly the things I'm not great at and that don't fire me up and don't fill me with energy. I was doing most of the people management, processes, procedures, trying to embed the kind of foundation that's going to help us kind of get to 50 million and and I I really I, I realized I don't want to do that anymore and so come February I sat in front of the board and said I'm either putting in a CEO or I'm done and I'm not doing that as an ultimatum but you've got to realize where my head's at and this is why I think it's a great idea and it took a few meetings for them to get on board we've hired a great CEO he's amazing he's so good at the things that I'm not good at and I'm staying put with the organization and I'm focused on a new push towards the end of illiteracy and there'll be much more coming out of that next year after I have a month off I'm having a month <laughs> off but I realized that I need to I need to live in my sweet spot. I need to remember what I'm good at. And the business, as it changes, needs a different leader. And I think we need to be, we need to recognise in ourselves what, you know, some founders are amazing at those things and really struggle with the startup phase. Mm. I know what I'm great at and, and I know myself well enough to say, okay, let's do this better. And I also, I love Library for All. I want the best for the organisation. Uh, and so, I, yeah, I think we're moving in the right direction. So it's that self-knowledge and realising what fires you up and fills your tank versus what drains you to nothing. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds to me, Rebecca, like you can see the bigger picture for library for all and understand that you're a part of that, but you've got to be your best part of that. Absolutely. And not have that ego attached to yep, and I should run it all the way through, which no is way. actually, you know, quite challenging for a lot of founders as they go through those stages. Yes. Well, on the back of that, Rebecca, I am also the former CEO of my business and big shout out to Ryan Swenson, who's currently doing all the things I hate as well. So I'm, they call me the chief evangelist. So this is my job to talk about my company, to take the vision of the next growth phase. And I too had the same situation. I was like, as soon as I ra we raised $4 million in four weeks, it was amazing, but it took four years to get there, of course. Um, and I was like, I'm not CEO anymore. I don't want to be CEO. But going back to your question, you, you, there's, there's the lead her sign at the back. And I love to create and synthesise information to make it easy for people to understand. So lead, for me... And I love acrostic poems, like when I was a kid. Yasmin, the Y was always really hard, of course. But L-E-A-D stands for leave ego at door. Now, that for me is a really powerful reminder of me as a founder. And I've pitched my pants off to people for five years as a female founder in her 40s, solo founder, because her husband had a mental breakdown. So she's on her own. She's got two kids. Who's looking after them? She runs a circular economy company. That's a social enterprise that has no tech. And she's really brash and bold and makes me feel uncomfortable. Why would we even invest in her? And that is me. And I never, ever pretended to not be that. So... The resilience comes from my truth and the fact that I'm a whole human who has fiercely believed in the vision and the business since day one. And I've managed to convince so many people to believe in me and when the shit hits the fan and you're eating all the shit sandwiches, there's one person that has to believe in you the most and that's you. So what did I do? Show real versus real real. It's one of my favourite quotes that I made up and Peter Ellis loves it. Shout out to her. The show real, you can Google me. I'm the only Yaz Grigalinas in the world and literally. And you'll see all lots of things about me. Um, the show real looks good. It, it does. Google's kind to me. But the real real is what I like to share more of. So my husband did have, former husband I should say, let me just preface that. So we were together for 25 years. We started the business as a, far, as a hobby 10 years ago. 
And, and I really ran the company. Like, it was my thing. So for five years it was a hobby. Then I jumped ship as the breadwinner in the family. I took all our financial security away. And it was very uncomfortable for him. And he had a breakdown and didn't work in the company for a few years. Then tried to come back and it was too hard. But anyway, long story short, he was in hospital. My daughter was in hospital. My mum died. Two days later his dad died. And this all happened in, within a few months of getting into an accelerator where I got 100 grand for 6% equity. And I had to go and almost resigned from the accelerator, but two men, and shout out to the men in the room, who are the ambassadors today, because we actually need more men in this room. It is disgusting that we don't have more men in this room. And the reason why is because we can't change unless we have the men in the room. Women will just rant and we'll say all these great things and we know they're true, but it won't move fast enough if we don't have some equity in the room. Anyway, I cried, it was hard, it was difficult, but I journal. And because I'm super intense, I've got to counterbalance that with the slow, slow down to speed up. And so when I wrote in my journals and I also video journal, very confronting. And I video journaled for the last four years or five years and I just record things, high highs, low lows, all the hard, all the easy, all the hell. Um, And when I Um, received a surprise package of a divorce request from my former husband, which was unexpected, just as I was about to, um, as I said, no to an acquisition. So I got offered, someone wanted to buy the company, but roll me up into their company. Great offer, great salary, great position. And I said no, because it wasn't authentic to where the business was going and I knew we weren't done yet. I said no to that. Then he decided if he was going to have to work on our marriage, he'd like to start with someone new. And that's how I got told that he wanted to end our marriage. And then I'm like, well, shit, I've got to close... Like, what do I do? I've got to close the business down. Why would I raise money and keep building something that's ours when there's no us? And I had that moment. It was, like, this time last year. Um, and I, I was, like, in a really difficult phase. And I called it gasp. Grief, anger, shock, pain. That was my first phase of divorce because I hated what I Googled. Um, And in my gasp phase, I realised that I actually, like, the truth, what I was pitching my pants off for four years, the people that believed in me, I could go and and to all of you, I could have called Sarah and she would have said, he's a dick, blah, 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 rant, 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 drink all the wine and suppress our feelings. But I didn't do that at all. I I, I chose to be lonely. I chose to read my journals. I chose to watch my videos. And I chose to get advice from myself. Because nobody knew what was going on in my heart, my heart, my soul, my mind. And I told me through the videos I watched back, it's very confronting, you should totally do it. And the journals I read, I read and heard Yaz say to me, your marriage is actually over and you're just holding everything together because it's not really okay to leave right now. And I didn't say any of those words, but I felt them. And when that happened, something inside of me, like I actually have to stand up, like I listened to the hut, which is the heart and the gut. Something inside of me lit up and I'm in extremely authentic. But what I realised was there was this little piece of me, like that final 10% of power inside that got unlocked when I truly spoke the truth to myself. And I thought, I'm not done I'm not ringing people who have believed in me forever. Sarah, Carolyn, Pauline, like all of you, Nat, I, you believed me for five years when I pitched and I reminded myself that I believed in me. And it's really hard to do that, but you have to do that work. And there was no way I was going to pick up the phone and say I'm done just because I've my, I was dropped, you know, go back to my teenage years, um, <laughs> dropped. Um, so I thought, you've got this, Yaz. So I locked myself in a capital raise cave, literally in the city for four weeks and I didn't see my kids for four weeks and I raised $4 million and I did it really fast because I know you can. And I did all the things in a really compressed period of time that I said I would do over the last five years because... We actually have the power and answers inside of us. But we say the wrong words. I can't, I won't, I'm not, I couldn't, shouldn't, just. They are weak as piss words that should not even come out of our mouths. 
The Little Engine That Could is my favourite book. And I said that to Nat the other day. Every entrepreneur, every, every entrepreneur and especially every female entrepreneur should get Waddy Piper's book, The Little Engine That Could. Because that little engine, she, was the smallest, weakest, tiniest engine. And all the locomotives told her she couldn't climb the mountain to get the toys over to the kids who were waiting on the other side. And all those locomotives told her she couldn't. And she said three words, four words. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And I can tell you that after everything that I have gone through, which is a shit show of a show reel, and it's ugly and unpretty and gritty and shitty. It truly is. We all have trauma, we all have hell, we all have hard and we all run from it. But actually, if you have your tribe and your people and they're all in this room, you have to get them to hold you to account, to hold yourself to account. And when the shit hits the fan, that is when women get moving because the power inside of us and that word power, we should start getting really comfortable using it. Women are powerful. Women are mighty Women have got this and we need to stop diminishing ourselves in our heads and start saying the words that make other people feel uncomfortable because that is where the magic happens, outside of the comfort zone. So walk away today and I just ask you one thing because that little engine, she got over the mountain and then she said, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could and of course she could. Walk out of here and start saying, I love myself. I'm flawed but I'm not going to sit on the floor and cry about it. I'm going to stand up and say, I am, a, I, am, this is, I am a fucking great founder. I'm a shit CEO. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love myself. I think I can. That is the only thing. The people, my people who reflect to me and remind me that it's okay to say all the stuff that comes out of my mouth <laughs> that makes people feel... Uncomfortable, And it makes them feel uncomfortable because they actually do believe in themselves. They're just too scared to say it publicly. So go out there and hashtag I love myself. When I get on your leader's LinkedIn site, I'm going to hashtag I love myself all day long and tag all of you so that you can start to learn to love you because if you don't love you, you'll never do all the things you want to do. Thank you. So I have to say, as you were sort of talking about the going up the mountain and trying to collect the toys for all the children, I started thinking about female entrepreneurship and what that mountain often is, and that mountain is how do we keep this together, and in the social space, the dirty word is how do we raise money or how do we fund towards that impact in taking the books, all the toys to the children. <laughs> it should be, it should be. Um, so... It's a question that lots of founders are asked about that, you know, capital raising, fundraising. But unfortunately, a lot of social entrepreneurs are not asked about that or it's seen like, well, if you're a not-for-profit, for example, that, you know, how do you actually make money? How do you sustain it? So I want to break through some of that as sort of my final questions before I throw to the audience. So I would love to hear from you first, Rebecca, if that's all right, because I know you've been on an interesting journey that other people can really learn yeah, from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are a not-for-profit. Um, if I had my time again, I would set up as a for-profit social enterprise. Um, just a bit of advice. That was the mistake I made 10 years ago. Um, but, um, gosh, it's taught me a lot. Um, I can't tell you that I've lost count of the number of no's we received in the first few years. We had to turn to Kickstarter to actually raise our, our seed funds. Um, we raised $110,000 on Kickstarter. We were one of the first not-for-profits to ever raise on Kickstarter. Um, and that got us our pilot in Haiti uh, in 2013. And then basically it's just a lot of doors. Um, you have to get comfortable with hearing the word no or you will not make it. There's just no other way around it. You have to. You can't be the four-year-old that stamps their feet and doesn't want to hear the word no. You literally have to get good at it and, and almost seek it out at first. Um, go to the places that you think are going to be the hardest to get money knowing that you probably will get a no just so that you get used to hearing no. And I don't hear no, I hear not now. And I maintain those relationships um, for decades. Uh, I call it the long recruit. 
Um, you might not want to fund me now, but you will fund yeah. me eventually. <laughs> um, and essentially, you know, once you're really comfortable with no, then you get really comfortable asking anybody for anything that's going to drive your mission forward. And once you really know what your why is and it's buried deep in your being, and I, I'm really lucky I get to live out my God-given purpose every single day. And I know some of you are probably thinking, I'm in the wrong box right now. I actually want to be over here. And so I would encourage you to do that. Don't waste the time and get moving. Um, we have a finite amount of time on this planet. And once you're comfortable with the no's, it gets a lot easier after that um, because you don't take them personally. I don't take it personally. It's a not now. And you can move on to the next door. And I think for us, one of the things that we built into um, the organisation, you know, I'm really good at finding ways to make money. I know that sounds weird because that's what every business is supposed to do. But as a not-for-profit, you live on the income and the power imbalance is quite frustrating, um, more, much more so than investors because they're invested in you doing well. Um, but quite often with us, philanthropy... Um, and big donors particularly, they like things done a certain way and they like lots of boxes to be ticked and they like reporting done in a certain way. And when you're really innovative and you're moving really fast, that can ruffle a lot of feathers. Um, and so one thing that really frustrated me was that I realised early that our scale was going to be limited by yeses from other people and what they were comfortable with us doing in the development sector. And the development sector is quite slow to respond to innovation because the donors are very slow to respond to innovation. And they don't love it. They talk about innovation. It's in all their magazines and books, but they actually aren't innovative at all. Um, and so we built in sustainable revenue sources very early on. Um, Probably six years ago, we started focusing on earned revenue, and now over 60% of our income is earned revenue. So we have the power to choose how we spend that revenue because no one wants to invest in R&D in the social enterprise space. They want the product at the end that helps people and is impacting the world, but they don't want to invest in it. And so we invest in our own R&D. Uh, we have a very big tech team and a very big tech um, push and focus um, to scale. And so we need that funding. And so we've grown, I mean, we did 11% of our revenue first year in our sustainable um, channels, and it's just continued to grow um, since then. And one day I hope we'll never have to ask for money again. Like I wanna get to the point where we're actually funding all of our scale ourselves. Mm. Uh, and I'm confident we will get there um, because philanthropy is just not moving fast enough to reach those 95. So you've got to look for money wherever you can find it. But what I have learned is that don't chase the money, if that makes sense. So don't mould yourself to fit that money because it will come back to bite you. Mm -hmm. If they're not the right investor for you, if they don't share the same values as you, if you can't sit and have a joyful conversation with that person and think, actually, outside of this, we'd be friends they're probably not the investor for you because what's going to happen is they might say the right thing at the beginning, but they'll try and turn your ship and they'll slowly try and turn your ship and you won't. it's kind of like being slow boiled. You won't realise it until one day you'll look in the mirror and go, shit, we're in a different port. I didn't expect to be here. Um, so really go be decisive about the type of money you want to go after and the type of people you want to work with. Um, you know, I met an investor... Funnily, one of your investors many years ago. And I was like, man, I would never sit down for coffee with this person. We do not share the same values. And, and I've had friends go through it where they've bought investors on and had to offboard them. And it's a really painful process. So just make the decision at the beginning that you're just not going to work with people. It, the money's not worth it. So find the money you want and go after the type of money you want and make sure your values are aligned and it will see you through every day. Yeah, values are such a big thing across across both commercial and, and social enterprises. Um, and I've seen founders really buckle and actually burn out and actually hurt their bodies. And it was values misalignment with the investment that they'd taken that chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, and then suddenly it's too late and you've realised, you know, your whole self has been compromised, not just your business. Gina, yes, please. <laughs> So Sunbubs has been bootstrapped, um, and I'm a huge fan of the old bootstrapping. Um, so we've, you know, obviously 
tucked into our family funds to start this business and get it rolling. And I feel I'm a huge fan of it because, you know, you're so tied to every dollar you spend, like, because you've spent a lot of time to earn those dollars. So you're very cautious. Well, I say cautious, but, you know, you're still an entrepreneur, so you're going <laughs> to, um, you know, with every dollar. But there's so many ways, um, you know, obviously you can get funding, um, you know, venture capital, I'm sure these ladies can speak so much more about this, uh, venture capital, angel investing, um, you know, crowdfunding, um, friends and family, you know, if you really truly believe in your calling and your brand, you'll reach out to your close network and get them on board and get them believing. Um, so, yeah, there's many avenues you can pursue. You know, um, with Sunburbs for us, you know, it was actually through failing um, that we decided to pivot um, our brand and our strategy and um, to, to get greater reach and to get greater growth. Um, and for us, strategic partnerships played a huge um, part. And again, it has to be the right partner the right people will see your brand to the next level. Absolutely. And Steph, I know yeah. you're, you're new into it, but I'd love to hear how you got started yes. and where you kind of see it going now. And I'd, in five years' time, I can't wait to hear how that goes. Yes, yeah, <laughs> very interesting. Um, I suppose for us as a law firm, you know, the funding model is probably quite different as well and the idea of raising capital. I mean, for us, starting out very lean and we're still very lean, we don't have an office space. We both work from home. We go to where the clients want to meet. We travel quite a bit. So um, for us, our front costs were things like websites, all of our registration, the Queensland Law Society requirements. That was probably one of the most expensive things that we had to go through. And insurance, professional indemnity insurance, very expensive for us, as it should be. I mean, it's a good... Um, protection there as well. So for us, um, yeah, leaning on family to help us um, with that initially. And the income that we obviously generate is from our brand. We are the brand, Cassie and I. That's what people come to us for. We're not selling a product. They come to us for us, for what we can provide them. So yeah, a lot of our fees and income is from billing and billing clients, getting the work in, getting it in the door quickly, doing the work good. We're good at what we do. We know what we're good at, and that's what we stick to. Um, and I think that's been really a good um, learning for us as well. And I think as lawyers, instinctively, you're taught that anyway. You've got to stay very close in your um, scope of matrix. You can't be advising on other things that you don't know about. That you get, in, get into trouble. So for us, being really clear on what we um, can advise on and... It's our bread and butter, it's what we do. So we know what we do, we know what we don't do, I think is the most important thing. And we won't stray there. Um, but our network of other lawyers and people that we connect to give us a broader range for our clients as well. Um, and for us, we're at the stage now, we've, got, we've brought, been able to bring on a paralegal, which we're very fortunate. I mean, we've only been um, starting, operating since February. We are able to pay ourselves. It's not very much, but it's something. I can. <laughs> um, I'm able to pay my bills, pay my Netflix subscription, you know, get coffee in the morning, all those really important things. Um, so we're able to do that, both Cassie and I, and um, we've worked really hard to be able to do that. It's a testament to the brand and the trust, the trust that people have in us and the work that, that we believe in and what we deliver to people. We stand behind that 110% and people resonate with that. They know that when they see you and meet you. And that's about being authentic to yourself as the ladies have spoken about this morning. People see that. And if you're not that, people see right through you. So it's being strong in who you are and what you do and what you're good at and just go for it. Um, so for us, we're at this stage now, we, hopefully next year we're able to bring on you know, a new lawyer, but we're at that stage. Do we continue to work our guts out, earn more, then bring someone on? Or do we bring someone on, they might get paid as much, that will generate more money. So we're sort of at this stage of thinking about what we do in terms of income and how to scale. So that's been really interesting. I think as lawyers, 
Um, the business side has been really interesting for us because um, we both worked in, down on Eagle Street and the big law firms. Everything's done for you. You don't have to worry about social media, finance, billing. You have a secretary to help you do everything. You just sit there and do the legal work. But now we're doing the business of the law as well as the law. So the law, giving legal advice, is only one little part of what we do. But like I'm here today talking about what we're doing, it's all the business stuff. So that's been cool and interesting to learn about too. Um, so we're getting good at that. We do have good social media, so you can go and follow us. That's been interesting too, like dealing with social media and branding because we're very conservative as lawyers. And, you know, it's like you've got to put yourself out there and say this and say that. We're like, oh, no, we can't possibly put that out. <laughs> so we're finding a good balance. So we're on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, so you can go follow us and give us a like. Um, so, yeah, that's where we're at right now in terms of, you know, our funding and hopefully we will, we will be able to grow. I know we will and we will do that. Um, and I think equally what's been touched on as well is failure for us being totally open and okay with failure. We know that it will come, it has come, there's always challenges. And we embrace it. Because when you fail, there's a lesson to be learned. And that's where the magic happens. Because you come out the other side with good learning. At the time, it's terrible and you think, oh my goodness, like, we've messed up, we've done this, we failed at this thing. But if I can just, you know, leave one thing with you is to embrace failure. It won't feel good at that moment, but what you learn from that is truly magic, and you will only grow from your failures. What I loved as well, Steph, that you said there, um, so we'd heard about saying, hearing no's, but I also love that you're like, this is not our zone, so you also say no to other zones and, and hand to others, which Ab is yes. a lesson that a lot of people take a long time to, to learn, actually, which Absolutely. is Absolutely, and I think for us also being very particular in the type of clients that we attract, and so in our social media and branding, we're very particular in what the messaging that we put out, because it's a reflection of us, it's a reflection of me and Cassie together as Parallax Legal. So that's us, what you see is us. So we need to be very focused on that and we want to attract a certain type of client. We won't take business from anyone. If you want to do the hard work, like come to us and we will help you through that process. And the same thing is like, you know, not, not all money is good money, you know, and that's a really big lesson as well. So being very particular on the client base that we draw in. It's only a good thing because Again, it's tied to who we are and the type of people we are, the type of business we want to leave. And Cassie and I, we've only just started, but we're already talking succession. Because it's not the Cassie and Steph show. Yes, we might have started this, but just like all of my ancestors and people that have come before me, we're creating something that will continue on without us being there. And so that's the end goal for us. We don't need to be involved in this forever because we want others, we're bringing people along with us um, to be able to continue the parallax journey. So that's very important for us as well. It's not about us. Again, we're part of a much bigger picture. Love it. Do you have any questions from the audience? Can we run some mics? <laughs> So, this question is for all of you. I'd love to hear all of you um, respond to this. Today we've got an audience which is predominantly women, and Yaz, I know you spoke about this, and, and thank you very much to all of the men in the room for coming along and supporting us women entrepreneurs. Um, now, we don't often get the opportunity as women entrepreneurs to speak about the challenges to a male audience. So, if all of you could imagine having a magic wand, being able to wave that magic wand and say something to all the men of Australia and tomorrow they wake up <laughs> and then <laughs> go and act on um, what you've told them based on your experiences, what hasn't worked well for you, what has worked well for you, those men in your lives that have influenced your journey in a positive or a negative manner, what would you say? 
I've worked in male-dominated industry all my life. So I was a pizza delivery driver at 17, the only female. Um, and then just worked in tech, hardware tech, only female. And, and I, so I was always like the weird one, but um, incredibly successful. And so the proof, I would, I would be able to prove, so data would say I'm really good at my job. So it would level the playing field. But what I would say to the men who um, are not in the room, like get in the room. You, you actually were born out of a vagina. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a woman. Um, look at your mother and see her strength and the power inside of the women around you. Look at your daughters, your nieces, your cousins, your friends, your sisters, the women around you. Women are actually as strong as men, but our strength is inside. We don't have all the guns and the muscles. We can't lift as heavy as you based on our power to weight ratio. But in the mind, we can. We will do you over every single time. So even though it's invisible, start to see that the power inside of us, not power over, but the power inside of us, we have got all the guns, we have got all the muscle, we have got all the gains, and we will take you on the journey. We do not want to do this alone in a woman's world that's all rah, rah, women are awesome, men suck, because we wouldn't be here without you either. Mm. So the important thing is that this is a we, us, our, not me, my, I, and you've, you've made me think that twice today, Steph. We, us, our, we cannot do this if we flip the narrative and have all the women in a room trying to fight for power. This is not a fight. We will all die and we will all be buried and we will all return to wherever we go to. But while we're here, we don't have time to waste. There's 168 hours in the week. We sleep for a lot, we eat for a lot, we do lots of other things, but there's a very small, finite amount of time we can actually get shit done. And we spend too much time talking and not enough time walking. So less yap yap, more tap tap. Come beside us, we're not as scary as you think and let us have the voice because everyone wants a strong woman until she's strong. Mm. Everyone wants a confident woman until she's too much. Let us be all that we are and don't let your ego stand in our way. I'm going to switch it a bit, Sarah, um, because there is only a couple of men, and kudos to you all. It was quite funny watching you walk in. You kind of magnetised to each other um, <laughs> in solidarity. Um, brave, really well. Good on you for being here. Um, I'm going to flip it a bit. Um, one of the things that I see in my female friends is that we're waiting for permission for our seat at the table, or we're waiting to be good enough to apply for the job, start the business, we're waiting to know that we can do it all and tick all the boxes. Women innately um, don't put themselves forward unless they feel really, really confident they can do it all, right? We'll wait for that opportunity to be given to us or we'll wait for the pay rise. And so I guess my encouragement to you is don't wait for a seat anymore. Like, stand up. Don't take a job you can already do. What the hell fun is that? If you can already do it, you shouldn't be applying for it because I guarantee you the men in the room aren't applying for it. If I've lost my mic. Um, if you can almost do it, think you can do it, know you can learn it, know somebody that can help you do it along the way, apply for the job, start the business. Like, don't hold yourself back. I think as women, we hold ourselves back. I think we hold our friends back. We don't encourage them enough. We don't tell them to get off their ass and do something about it. Um, one of my friends is in the room right now and her and I had many conversations about something she wanted to be about. And I said, enough, I don't want to hear about it anymore. Until you're prepared to do something about it, then we'll talk about it. And we did, and she did, and she's amazing. I think as women, we don't hold each other accountable enough to make those bold and brash steps. Like, it's so awesome that you guys are funding yourself. That's how Library for All started, sold everything and funded it. Just back yourself and don't wait for the world to change. Change for our daughters, not that I have, I only makes boys. It changed... 
it, it'll change for our daughters or the next, their daughters. It's not going to change for you all in this room. I'm sorry to let you know. It's not going to change in a massive way the way that we want to see it. So don't wait for it to change. Do what you want to do that you're passionate about and really think about what is the your why and what is the impact on people and planet that your business is having or that you're having. And I guess my encouragement to be would to be to really consider what that is and to really think about it. I think every business we have has an impact on the world or the people around it. It's whether it has a positive impact or a negative impact. And we all have a responsibility to be thinking that way. And so, yeah, I'm just... Sorry, Sarah, I kind of... I love Sarah. It was a good question. <laughs> but, but as there are hardly any men in the room, I wanted to speak to the women and, and really, yeah, just kind of stand up. Let's just be bold, be brave... Do it is what you're passionate about because if you are passionate about it, that will shine through and your authenticity will shine through and people will back you every day of the week. I think from my perspective and when I think back to just my corporate career again, um, it's really just celebrating the men that prop you up. Um, you know, because as we've noticed, we don't tend to have that, that voice. We're not, hey, I'm here. So it's celebrating the men and surrounding yourself with women and men that are going to prop you up. Um, so just be careful who you choose as your close circle. Um, be very selective um, because they're really going to be there when things get tough. Yeah, good answer. yeah I think... Like, for anyone, I think the act of, like, deep listening is really important. And I know that, I'm just not generalising, but, you know, there's, that can be difficult um, for some people. So, you know, deep listening to what somebody is actually saying. And I think the concept of awareness, if we're talking to men, like, just awareness. Like, as women, I'm, I'm, as a, and as an Aboriginal woman, I'm totally aware of everything that's going, probably even more hyper aware of what's going on around me. I have to be. That's just the truth of the matter. So I'm totally aware of everything that's going on around me at all times. That's just the innate thing that's occurred. So I think awareness from a man's perspective is really important too. Um, and the interactions that you have with women. And I think of my own interactions with men um, in my journey, I've had some really great role models who have opened doors for me. Yes. So when I was starting, Greg Sellers, he's no longer with us anymore, but he gave me my first job when I applied at university, working at a very small law firm. He'd throw me in the deep end with matters. We'd talk about things after work and matters, how to do things. Malcolm McBrackney down on Eagle Street um, in the commercial law firm showed me how to interact with clients, the business of things, pushing me out there in front of people and always having my back. As a leader of the team, and yes, it's a male-dominated area as well, there's more women lawyers coming up, but at that level, at that partnership level, he was the leader of our team um, at that time and he totally backed me and totally valued me as an employee and so I worked my guts out for him and I think the importance of really good leadership in that way was so important. And then when he left, well, it wasn't the same. I would start looking elsewhere. So you follow people. So I think opening doors for people along the way and having time. Again, I had breakfast yesterday with Stephen Kime. He's a silk human rights lawyer. Does really great work um, in our legal profession. Caught up with him yesterday. I've known him since I was studying... Um, at university, always having the time. Steph, what are you doing? Tell me about Parallax Legal. Do you need help with something? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? I think that's also a testament to my own investment in relationships I've put in that time with people as well, and that's been reciprocated um, along the way. So I think relationship development, men or women, is really important. It's a two-way street, and it's a long game. I'm seeing the results of those relationships that I started when I was at uni. I really, I really love that. I think, you know, just to add, SJ, um, one thing that I would say to a room full of men is about the networks that they hold. I think there's a lack of awareness sometimes about how well their own networks work. And so if they can spot us and say, I am going to open my network continuously, that happens 
in other spaces that we're not invited to, that can be so impactful. It has literally changed so much of the trajectory, me finding those people who were willing to open up their networks, and I ask them for that upfront. I, I don't just want money, I also want your networks, because I don't have access to those areas. Any other questions from the audience? To be quiet, yes. Come Surely on. someone has a question out there. How much? We got one at the back there. Yay! <laughs> so uh, you mentioned about uh, essentially confidence of not putting yourself out there. How, how do we go about inspiring that change, both in younger females but also more senior professional ones that are ready to make that leap right now? Well, Brené Brown says brave, and, and of course I turned it into an acrostic. Um, so for me, brave is a word, but it's not a, th a thing we do. It's, and so to turn it into something that we do by expanding on the words of um, brave for me is being raw, authentic, vulnerable every day. And when you can actually strip away the layers and the suits of armour that we wear, that we're taught to wear when we turn up to our first jobs, don't cry, wear a suit, don't be too much, too loud, too bold, too shy, too intense, too quiet. And I think that those two words, the B2 words, are actually people reflecting back the most authentic version of who you are. And if you listen to those words, the commonality, like my report card said, I talk too much. Of course I do. That's why I do what I do. You find your, your focus area. And I wasn't, when I tried to be quiet, it didn't work and it sucked my soul away. So I actually think when people tell you what you are and you're each hopefully thinking right now, oh my God, I've always been told I'm too this, the B2, whatever the word is, that's actually part of your superpower. And then look in the mirror and say, well, what does someone who's too loud and talks too much do? Like, obviously go find the role that, that speaks to your soul. And again, I just feel like the word confidence... Um, you know, and I don't even like the, the imposter stuff because I think that it's just words that we use to tell us to shape behaviours that are not true based on generations that have told us to be a certain way. And today, Steph, you've hit me emotionally multiple times because I can feel your ancestors through your voice. And that is so important. And I think that we just have to capture the confidence and I feel your confidence. Mm -hmm. And I'm in love with it. I want to have coffee with Steph. And I will because I want to feel her confidence to help me work on the areas of myself that need work. And so I think we just have to own it. Find your own way to accept all those B2 things that people label you as and start to see them as your strengths, not your flaws. And, to, and that's the hard, uncomfortable work we have to do. And we can't be scared to do it. So... Do I pitch strong for a girl? Apparently. Do I talk too much? Apparently. Do I unfiltered? Apparently. All those things, yes. But instead of spending time and energy that we can never renew because time ticks away every day, fixing things that are not natural to me, I take that time and I use it as a force multiplier to be the most more authentic version of me, which is a confident, strong, bold woman who's prepared to help beat down the things that have been put in front of us because of generational design that was um, typically done by white men in this country. And I love white men. Absolutely, I love them. But we do need to move faster than we're currently moving. And it's going to take loud and proud voices and more systemized voices. And when we bring all of those voices together and create this beautiful kaleidoscope of difference that is when we can go the most distance and we just have to do it hard and fast soft and slow and together i just add to that i think um i think one of the pieces of your question you were kind of saying what can we do to help right um one of the things i've seen done really well is a leader um that we attend their meetings sometimes um, had noticed that the men always speak first mm. uh, so the whole group of men would speak first before women would then kind of get their turn almost. And he had noticed this, so he took the men aside and said, hey, guys, for the next four meetings, 
you're going to not say a word until all the women have spoken. And then you can have an opinion. And it's not that I don't value your opinion. It's just that you are dominating the conversation and not leaving enough room. So it was really, it was quite controversial and it um, caused some a stir um, and lots of, you know, um, talk around the water cooler. Um, but I, I thought that was really brave of him to, A, see it. So he was aware, he was watching. Um, how can he engage more women in the conversation? Um, and also he was brave enough to kind of pull the guys aside and say, hey, this is what I'm observing. This is what I'd like to see um, happen more. And what it did was it actually made the guys in the room aware. They hadn't realised and they were, oh, wow, I didn't actually realise I always speak first. And they actually caught themselves now. They catch themselves regularly. We have a joke about it. And they catch themselves and they're like, shit, I've done it again. Um, and so things like that, I think being aware and seeing what's happening in the room and you think your meeting is really inclusive because everybody spoke, you think everybody spoke that wanted to speak, but in actual fact, they've kind of done the dance that happens at every meeting. Um, and so things like that, I think. And then I think if you've got girls, I think being really mindful of the words you say to them and being really mindful of the words that other people are allowed to say to them. Um, and really stepping in and turning those back around. Um, you know, all the common ones about being bossy and about, um, you know, all those things, you know, turn it around and it's like, wow, you've got some serious leadership skills. Look at you lead, look at you go, you know, like, so kind of just being really mindful of the switch and making sure that you're not asking them to fit into a mould and not be their authentic self. Because, again, it's like being slow-boiled. It happens over decades. But being really careful about the people that are allowed to speak into their life. And quite often it's well-meaning people that don't realise what they're saying. Grandparents, for instance, and you have to catch them and go, no, no, don't say that. That's not OK. That is doing this. And ha being bold enough, especially if you're the dad, they're going to listen to you because you're standing up for your daughter. Um, and I think it's a really, we shouldn't be saying to our daughters, they're our princesses. Sure, they are. They're your princess. That's how you, they're the apple of your eye. But they're also CEOs, doctors, astronauts. They can be anything they freaking want. And we should be encouraging them. You know, the princess dress up numbers compared to other options for girls is unbelievable. So seek out those other options and really encourage that super early. Um, because that bravery will then just be innate and they'll have it in spades and then when someone tries to put them in their place, they'll just brush it off and move on. I love that, Rebecca. That's a really practical tip and I just have to share when my five-year-old son's report came in from daycare last week, it talked about his communication and the first thing it said was that he does turn-taking and I was like, oh, I'm doing good. I'm changing the next generation. He does turn-taking. <laughs> Gina, you have two daughters. What, what's some of the experiences that you've had with your daughters that, you know, you want to leave with them and inspire a change moving forward? Well, for starters, that one person um, can certainly make a difference, uh, that even your crazy idea, voice it. You never know where it can go. Sometimes it's over the breakfast table, isn't it, darling? Um, you know, so I think... Have the courage, um, do it. Um, you know, don't wait, um, just go for it. Um, and I think the next thing is probably to, from an early age, celebrate female leaders, you know, because we do need to see them to be them. So I think we need to just have more of them, that they're just common. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Probably just adding on a little bit there, for me, it's been a bit different. Like, where I come from, we're a matriarchal society, so it's different. Like, all the... Yes, men play a very important role in our communities, and they always have, but where I come from, Kornamooka people, and particularly my line of women, where it's a matriarchal society. So, even being told that as a young child, that obviously impacts and how we think about ourselves and our relationship with my mum and my sisters and my aunties and my grannies and how important that is. And everyone knows that. So for me, it's a little bit different. And I think knowing that early on has really um, impacted how I look at myself and others and 
knowing that, yeah, you really can do anything. And my family would be happy with anything that I did. I could be whatever, but this is what I chose. And, yeah, they're happy for me to do that. You know, the expectation was never there to go out and, um, you know, be a lawyer and have your own law firm. That came from me entirely. It was all about the service of giving back to people, which, again, linking to who you are and where I come from and what I do. So it's all connected from my point of view. Um, and, yeah, the thing about perfection as well, like for us, again, as lawyers, you know, just can drive you insane sometimes, like to start the business. I'm like, everything's got to be all done before we launch and press go. People are like, no, you can't do it. You just got to do it. You got to start, you got to start, you got to start. I'm like, no, 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 I've got to do this first and that and that and that. And there's this list. And then it just came to a point where we're like, all right, we've got to jump. And we did it. And we're like, man, why didn't we do this earlier? <laughs> we're like learning every day and on the job. And that's the beauty of it. It's exciting. It's fun. You get ahead. There's challenges. There's failures. But it's all part of it. Yeah. It's just being open to all of that. So if you're thinking about it, take the leap. Yeah. And you'll be OK. You'll be OK no matter what. That's the thing. You'll be emphatically OK. Yes. You'll be OK. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm looking for someone to give me a time check because I don't have a watch on. Do I have time for one more question or one more roundup question? One more. one more question from the audience. Oh, one more question. One more question from the audience. This is your time. Otherwise, I'm going to jump in with, with my question. Okay. Um, I am uh, trying to get better at celebrations um, because as entrepreneurs, it's a real roller coaster. You can have like I had an incredible week last week, and then boom, straight back down on the other side, and. Um, I've started to do a little routine now when I'm having those uh, good mm. moments yes. that I share with Steph. Yeah. I just light myself a sparkler at home. I'm like, what a great day. Yeah. What a great day. <laughs> um, but I would like to hear from each of you what you want to celebrate on this day. About entrepreneurship, about yourself, about women. What would you like to celebrate today? start, I suppose. So I just celebrate all of you being here, making the decision to turn up today to this event. So I'm celebrating you all being here, so thank you for turning up and my fellow panel members. So, yeah, I think it's a celebration of you to turn up here today to listen to what we have to say and hopefully take something away, even if it's just planting a seed of something, anything. So that's what I'm celebrating and hopefully giving people the spark to move forward. So I'm celebrating you. <laughs> I think for me, it's our innate strength. Yeah. We can do hard things, we can do them well, we can do lots of hard things all at once. So I think it's uh, celebrating that really unique aspect of us women. Um, for me, it would just be the fact that we're having this conversation um, and focused on impact. You know, I think that I just want to, you know, I, I would love to have lots of conversations with you all um, today and find out, you know, where your, what your why is and, and what your impact you're planning to leave uh, here is and just kind of really celebrating that. And I think if we can shift the dialogue from balance sheets and obviously balance sheets are super important. We all need them. They all need to be strong to do what we want to do, but really shifting that dialogue to the impact that we're having, positive or negative, because if you don't know you're having a negative impact, you can't change it. Um, so really thinking about that and celebrating the positive impact you're having um, in this world. Yeah, I think I sit on the same theme. I'm going to celebrate. So it's been a year since I learned of, of my life change. And there's a number of people in this room who I want to celebrate because if it wasn't for them sharing their authenticity and vulnerabilities, and especially Sarah and Pauline, and, and they went through a similar experience to me, we all just are so cracked and flawed, all of us, every single one of us. Yet we try and hide our cracks and flaws away to create this beautiful perfection on the surface, which of course is not true. So I celebrate the women that have held my heart and my soul for the last 12 months um, I get a bit teary I, and because I have an autistic daughter who is at home today for the third day this week 
And once upon a time in my marriage, that would just like she would have been forced to go to school today because she needs to prepare for the real world. And how can you be smart if you don't turn up at school? And she can't turn up at school. But I'm going to celebrate this since she's lived with me full time um, in March. The women who have held my heart and let me learn to be the best parent I can be, which is the perfectly imperfect parent that I am. My daughter has a safe space to say to me last night, Mum, I just, I really want to go to school tomorrow, but I just can't. I don't know why. I just feel really anxious. I know it's my third day this week. I know you've given me permission to have one day off a week. And I know I'm asking too much. And she's 16 and my daughter is so brave to come to me to say I need permission to be okay, not feeling like I'm a shit person because I want another day off school this week. And the women that have shaped me for the last 12 months have made me a really freaking amazing mother and I'm more proud of that than any business I could ever build and my daughter is safe and she's at home and I don't care about the metrics of her having 50 plus days off school this year. The metrics don't matter. The moments matter. And I want to thank you, my special friends, for the moments you've given me this last 12 months because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you. Thank you so much for rounding out that way, Yes, because I would like to thank my special friends on this panel as well and thank you so much for being open and authentic and doing what you do and, and really um, sharing those hard lessons, sharing things about yourselves. I've loved this panel. Thank you. Please join me in thanking. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much to firstly Zoe um, and to our wonderful panellists. There was just so many inspiring and thought-provoking insights there, I think, for all of us. So I'm sure that we will walk away with a lot of takeaways from that. This brings us now to the Lead Hers Awards. These were made possible from a very generous donation from Dr Jessica Gallagher. So for those of you who don't know her, Jess was the former Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Engagement and Entrepreneurship at UQ. And she is now uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor for um, External Engagement at the University of Adelaide. Um, sorry, Deputy Vice Chancellor she is at the University of Adelaide. So Jess is a very big advocate for women in entrepreneurship and we are very grateful for her support over the years. So unfortunately, living in Adelaide, she was unable to join us today to present these awards, but she has asked Cayetana Martinez to award the winners in her place. So Cayetana um, has also got a lot of history with us. She was formerly the UQ, this is a big title, sorry, UQ Ventures Entrepreneurship Senior Program Designer. <laughs> Uh, and instigated our first Lead Hers program in 2018. She is now the Innovations Business Unit Director at the Growth Drivers. So it is very fitting that we have Kayatana back with us to present the Lead Hers Awards today. Thank you, Kayatana. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be in here presenting these awards today on behalf of Jessica Gallagher. I'll promise I'll keep it very short. Nobody wants a long speech right before the awards. But I thought because Jessica really wanted to be here today, she's in the UK at the moment, I would love to share some of the things that she shared with the Lead Hers cohorts while she was coming to our programs in the first few years while we were running them. The first thing that she said, and I remember that still very well, was do not let the monkeys bring you down. <laughs> and I think we can all relate to that because we all have those sort of monkeys, right? Could be people, situations, or even our internal thoughts that make us second guess ourselves. And she was really good at not letting those monkeys drive the bus. The second thing that I really, really appreciate from her was that she kept saying this thing to us in every program. 
Do not say sorry, say thank you. Again, I see a lot of heads nodding because that's such a common situation, right? When you just apologize for being yourself, for taking up space. And I think she was wonderful and walking that line that many women in this room walk every day of making space for others while holding her own space very proudly. And the last thing that she shared with me, and, and that was only with me, I saw her recently in Adelaide, and I was sharing how I'm feeling at my current job, at the very, very limit of what I can do every day. <laughs> and I was saying to her, you know what, I think I feel that imposter syndrome people talk about. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, you know what, that doesn't make you a bad leader, that only makes you human. And that's currently my mantra every day. <laughs> Before I walk into challenging situations at work, I try to remember that myself. This is not making me a bad leader, it's making me human. So Jessica, it's, it's been such a pleasure to watch her lead, has been one of the best gifts of running the Lead Hers programs. And she is definitely one of these leaders that holds Things that seem incompatible simultaneously. She can be very decisive, but very inclusive. She can be incredibly funny, but also very assertive. She can be very quick, but also very patient. And for me, has been an incredible role model that I keep very close to my heart, and I constantly keep in touch with her because it's someone I keep learning from. So I just want to bring a little bit of jest here today for the ones that maybe haven't known her as much. And without further ado, we'll jump down into the awards. So as you know, the Leaders Awards showcase and celebrate outstanding leadership capabilities demonstrated by women in entrepreneurship. From female founders and students leaders to those making a positive impact in their communities. Sorry, awkward turn of page. We have received 45 nominations for the three categories. And the nominations were very, very impressive. Each award will receive a cash prize of $1,500, thanks to Jess. The three awards are the Student Award, which recognizes a current student enrolled at the University of Queensland, who has demonstrated leadership capabilities in a job or volunteer role. The Entrepreneurship Award, that recognizes a woman who has developed an innovative and entrepreneurial venture. And the Community Award, that recognizes the leadership skills that have been provided by a woman in a community context. So now, let's go to the announcements. We'll start with the Student Award. The finalists for the Students Award were Alicia Martin, Kylie Ho, Miki Dunan, Ming Xuan Zhu, and Yuan Qin Chuang. And the winner of this award is Ming Xuan Zhu. <laughs> Ming Xuan is currently Min Chuan is currently studying a Bachelor of Engineers specializing in mechatronic engineering at UQ. Min Chuan application stood out for the incredible diversity of leadership roles and experiences she has taken on during her undergraduate study. She has been, I think, in all the ventures programs. <laughs> and on top of that, she has collaborated and been part of a lot of the UQ events in leadership and volunteering roles. So thank you so much, Min Congratulations. Okay, moving on to the second award, the Entrepreneurship Award. The finalists were Claire Shears, Johnny Sitzma, Juliette Murphy, Sabrina Chakori, and Sarah Richardson. And this award goes to Julie Murphy, co-founder and CEO of FloodMap. Unfortunately, <laughs> Juliet is not here today. She is in a team building a whole day event, so she couldn't be here with us today. But Marisa Metzina will collect the award on her behalf. Marisa Metzina is one of our amazing UQ staff members that works with the UQ uh, departments of... <laughs> Thank you. But before we move into the next award, I would like just to read a little bit about Juliet's uh, bio because she's a truly amazing entrepreneur. 
Juliette stood out to our judges for her innovation, positive impact, and the strong traction she has achieved. She started her business, FloodMap, after experiencing the devastating impacts of flooding in Brisbane. FloodMap is an early stage technology company that specializes in rapid real time flooding forecasting and flooding flood inundation mapping to provide greater warning time that can potentially save lives. Earlier this year, and listen to this, FloodMap raised 8.5 million in seed funding from as Union Square Ventures, a, funding, uh, a, funding, a seed funding based in New York. So this is an amazing achievement for all of you that are in the entrepreneurship space, $8.5 million in seed funding. Currently, FloodMap is used customers across Australia and the USA with offices in Brisbane and New York. So congratulations, Julien. Hope you're having a wonderful team building day. <laughs> and thank you, Marisa, for picking the gift in her behalf. Awesome. Let's move to the last award. The finalists for the community award are Jessica Cole, Sarah Jane Petterslingem, Sophia Zafar, Vivina Mokoma, Jik Ling Lam. And the award goes for Dr. Sophia Zafar. Dr. Sophia Zavar is a specialist pediatric dentist and a discipline lead in pediatric dentistry at the University of Queensland. Sophia has been instrumental in supporting international Muslim students and Muslim community members during the COVID-19 pandemic in Australia. She is also part of the Pakistanis in Australia management group and assists new students in settling in Australia. She runs an oral health awareness program for children attending Quran classes at the Holland Park Mosque. She is the co-director of the Al Kalam Student Support Trust, which bears the educational expense of students from disadvantaged families in Pakistan, mostly Muslim girls. Her trust is also involved in projects related to providing clean water for drinking to people living in the remote areas of Pakistan. Dr. Safar's leadership has impacted members at a personal level, professional level, and community level. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you so much to all of you for being here today and congratulations again to all the winners. Again, it has been my pleasure to announce these awards on behalf of Dr. Jessica Gallagher and I'll pass this back on to Sally. Thank you. Thank you, Kay Ooh. Thank you, Kayatana, and a huge congratulations to all of our nominees and, of course, the winners as well. So that actually concludes the formalities of our event today. Thank you for, to all of our special guests for coming along and sharing uh, such valuable information with us all. And, of course, to all of you for coming along today. It's time to enjoy the rest of the Lead Hers Rise event. We encourage you to make the most of your time getting to know each other, making some new acquaintances and enjoying some coffee and morning tea. Um, just as a final reminder, please make sure that you share the post um, from our LinkedIn UQ Ventures page or do your own Lead Hers post. As you'll see, there's a couple of posters up talking around how you can um, post so that you're included in the running for that styling session um, that is going to be awarded to someone for their social media post. But thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, and I look forward to talking to you uh, now as you make your way over. So thank you. And please just, again, thank all of our special guests today. Thank you. Thank you.